Hey guys, this is Suzanne Light coming to you today with a lesson on the fruits of the Spirit found in Galatians 5. Now, I'll just tell you right now, this is going to be a continuation of series, and I hope to be able to cover at least one fruit on every lesson. There's a lot of material here. You know, the fruits of the Spirit is, is something that we hear about, but sometimes maybe we don't know explicitly what Paul was talking about. But what, let's, let's look at what's happening in the book of Galatians when this starts. I like to know the history behind something before I really delve into it and start teaching it. Paul, by the, by the God's Spirit that was working in him, uh, the church was brought about, brought about in Galatia. And so when Paul had gone away, there were false teachers that came in after Paul got the church started and the believers of Christ had turned, they wanted to go back to the old Jewish customs that they were um, familiar and comfortable with. You know, when we turn to Christ, we have to turn away from a lot of things that are old and comfortable and familiar with us because we're turning to a better thing. And there had been false teachers coming back in saying once again that they had to be circumcised as in the old Jewish ruling, and they did not. So what Paul is doing in uh, chapter 5 of Galatians, he is writing to them and he's being very critical with them because he wants them again to understand the message of Christ and the freedom. And I guess I say freedom. Some people think that when you turn your life over to Christ, that it's giving up so much and it's so right the opposite. It is inheriting so much. So don't ever think that you're giving up things in life to be a Christian. I'm just going to skip around the first part of Galatians 5. He said, so Christ has made us free. Now make sure that you stay free. When you get out from under that bondage, he said, don't get tied up again in the chains of slavery to the Jews and the ceremonies. And that's the same thing could apply to us, not to get tied back up into the things of the world. Christ is useless to you if you're counting on clearing your debts to God by keeping the old laws. So you can't straddle the fence. You've got to do one or the other. Because if you go back to the old ways, you're lost from God's grace. But we, by the help, and I'm reading from the Living Bible too, by the way. But we, by the help of the Holy Spirit, are counting on Christ's death to clear away our sins and make us right with God. And we, to whom Christ has given eternal life, don't need to worry about whether we have been circumcised or not, or whether we're obeying the Jewish ceremonies. For This is the important statement. For all we need is faith working through love. That's what Christ says. He said, who has interfered? It only takes like one person to come in and to turn y'all astray. And, and Paul was very aggravated that people had come in and changed the message. But Paul was not, he was not giving up. He said, I'm trusting the Lord to bring you back to believe in as I do about these things. God would deal with that person, whoever he is, that's been troubling and confusing you. So when you change your life over to Christ, you got to stay away from some of the old. You can't get back into the old, the old saying of straddling the fence. You can't do that. It goes on verse 13, says, For dear brothers, you have been given freedom, not freedom to do wrong, but freedom to love and serve each other. And he says, I advise you to obey only the Holy Spirit's instructions. He will tell you where to go and what to do. And you say, Suzanne, how? How can the Holy Spirit? He will work in you. You will know. Uh, Ashley and I were talking earlier about things that, um, that you struggle with when you're single and things that you struggle with when you're younger. And if the Holy Spirit is in you and you're doing something that you know that you shouldn't, when the Holy Spirit is in you, and we're, we're all sinners, we fail, but you're going to have that feeling of conviction that this is not what I need to be doing. So he said the Holy Spirit will tell you where to go, where you feel comfortable at, and what to do. And then you won't always be doing the wrong things that your evil nature wants you to do. Our evil nature wants us to do things against what God wants us to do. John and I have seen that the last six weeks. We've been in such terrible eating habits for the last long time, that our 
our flesh wants to eat all this stuff that's not good for us. And we're really having to lean on the Holy Spirit for strength to eat the right things. He says, um, we naturally love to do evil things that are just opposite from the things that the Holy Spirit tells us to do. And the good things we want to do when the Spirit has his way with us is just the opposite of natural desires. That's because we're born into a world of sin. We're in flesh. We're carnal. This. And unless the spirit person inside of us is guiding us, telling us where to go, what to do, how to react, all of that, we will convert back to what the flesh wants to do. He says, when you follow your own inclinations, your lives will produce these evil results. Impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, spiritism that's encouraging the activity of demons, hatred and fighting, jealousy and anger, constant effort to get the best for yourself, complaints and criticisms, the feelings that everyone else is wrong except for those in your own little group, and there will be wrong doctrine, envy, mur murder, drunkenness, wild parties, and all that sort of thing. But let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And here there is no conflict with the law. Those who belong to Christ have nailed their natural evil desires to his cross and crucified them there. And that's what we have to do with our carnal instincts is to nail them to the cross and say, Lord, you guide me, you direct me, you do you showing me and you live in me the things that you want me to do. So I just read you Galatians 5.22, which is the main verse for this whole lesson. And that is the fruits of the Spirit. He said he will produce this kind of fruit in you. We all produce some kind of fruit. We have to decide what that fruit's going to be. He says, if the last verse, or 25, says, if we're living now by the Holy Spirit's power, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Then we won't need to look for honors and popularity, which lead to jealousy and hard feelings. So what I find in the Christian world today is that there are people, and I'm not judging, I'm seeing, I see things just like you see things, we all see it, but there are people that think they can live both ways. And the Bible clearly says that blessings and cursings cannot come out of the same mouth. He also says you cannot live in the light and live in the dark at the same time. You've got to be either in the light or you are in the dark. Um, you know, in, in years past, I'm in a Pentecostal church. And in years past, even when I started to the Pentecostal church, there were so many things that were wrong. You heard about the things that were wrong all the time. You didn't, you didn't hear as much about the, the freedom and the love and the liberties that you had as the things that you couldn't do. And the Pentecostal churches have gotten away from that. But unfortunately, like all other churches, we've gone so far to the other side that anything goes. And that's what we can't do. When, when we have the fruits of the Spirit actually living in us, manifesting themselves in us, we are going to be separate from the world. And you say, Suzanne, that's impossible. We cannot be separate from the world. You can be living in the world, but not be of the world. The, the Bible says, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, do not conform to the things of this world. So we can be a light. And that's our theme at our church is to be light in a dark world. There are people that will want what you have when they see that you have something that triumphs over the darkness, when they see the victories in your life, when they see the blessings in your life. And so it's no wonder that the very first fruit that God talked about is love because love trumps a lot of things. In our nation in the last couple of weeks, we've not seen very much love, not at all. I've been very disappointed um, at the behavior of our political leaders. Love trumps a lot of things. Now, it shouldn't trump wrong. 
but love will give um it will it just acts differently you can you can be very set in what you believe and do and still have love that's what i'm trying to say and love was the very first thing that he that god said that we needed to have so he talked about love joy peace long suffering kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control we're going to talk about all those in the coming weeks can we have these fruits before we accept christ can you have those things that i just read before you accept christ i think that you can have a form thereof but i think that they are not life-changing unless they are spirit powered and the spirit does that when christ when we accept christ he wants us to go through a sanctification process in our life and this part is very hard for a lot of people. They want to say they accept Christ, yet keep doing the same things that they've always done. And that, you know, the Bible just does not say that. If it does not line up with the Word of God, what you're doing, you better search and find out what it is, whether it's controlling your tongue, whether it's your lifestyle, whether it's what you eat or what you drink, what you say, how you behave, you gotta make sure that it lines up with the Word of God. So what is sanctification? Some of you probably have never even heard that. And sanctification, a lot of churches have gotten away from that. But sanctification is when God wants to make us into a better and a more holy person, a person that is more like him, Christ-like. He wants to transform us by the renewing of our mind, what I just told you. You don't think like you used to think. There is a change. And then he wants to put right thinking into our thought process. And so that is a form of sanctification. And sanctification comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's just what I was saying. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one that's going to power those fruits of the Spirit in our life. That's the reason it's different. I'm not saying if you're not a Christian that you can't love because you obviously you can. But when you love Christ-like, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit in a whole different realm of love. Um, you have to be willing, this is important, to work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit to start the sanctification process. And you, you have to be willing to lay things down. And y'all, you will know because the Holy Spirit will guide you and direct you to the things that feel right and that don't feel right. He'll speak to you and he'll speak to you through his word. His word is so important because when it gets in you, it starts changing who you are. You will need to find out what godly qualities God will want you to put on. And then you'll also want to know what qualities that he will want you to put off, to take off, to put away. So when God the Father purposely isolates and spells out nine specific qualities that will be coming directly from the Holy Spirit, then he is really letting you know the extreme importance of these nine gifts because he, he, he called these aside and talked about them. They're major fruits and qualities that's coming directly from God himself. When you look at Galatians 5.22 in the Bible, the word spirit is capitalized. And the reason that it is, is because it's coming directly from the Holy Spirit. It is a part of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's coming straight for Him. Not what we can do on our own, but what the Holy Spirit can do through us. And what this means that it's God's love. It's God's joy. It's God's peace. It's God's long suffering. All of those fruits are being transmitted into our personality directly from the Holy Spirit. So think about the ramification of this. God the Father himself is allowing us to share in a part of his divine nature by allowing his Holy Spirit to transmit and impart those nine qualities right into our soul and personality from him, directly from him. That's pretty dadgum awesome. 
that he loves us so much that he wants to impart the very qualities of him, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost into us. That's why God's telling us that, you know, the gifts are coming from the Spirit so that we can fully appreciate the magnitude of what they are and where they're coming from instead of saying, you need to work on this and you need to accomplish this. He is telling us that through the Holy Spirit, that that's where we're going to be nurtured from. Through the Holy Spirit is going to minister to us. Just like in the Bible, it says Jesus already told us that he is the vine and we're the branches. The branches draw their life from the vine, right? Not vice versa. The branches draw their life from the vine. We draw the gifts from the Holy Spirit. Just as the branch draws its life to the vine, we must draw our life directly from Jesus. So these are incredible scriptures. This, these scriptures leading up to this. Let's talk about love, the first fruit of the Spirit. Let's talk about love. Um, as I said, it's ranked number one, and I think it's ranked number one for a purpose because I think it's the most important thing that when we get into God's love, how different it is. The Bible says that God is love, that he is love. So when we're accepting love from the Holy Spirit, we're accepting God. And that makes it the perfect source to learn how to love others even when it's difficult. Well, that's hard. You know what we're going to talk about the different kinds of love here in just a minute just a minute but our world has truly skewed the real meaning of love but god's word remains a steadfast true source of knowledge on how to love um love is a word that's abused a lot it's it's used against other people but god never uses it against us he uses it for us. 1 John 4, 7, 8 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. John 4, 9, 12 says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another because that's what he tells us to do. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. We're not even worthy of his love. None of us are. We're not worthy. John 15, 12 through 13 says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. I've said so many times in teaching, there's no way that I could give Ashley up for someone else because I love her so much. There's two different kinds of love that's written about in the Greek language. And I'm just gonna hit very lightly on this, but the first one is agape love. And this is the love that's represented for love, God's love for us. That's the agape love. It's non-partial, sacrificial love, best exemplified for God's provision for our rebellion. <laughs> and, um, but then there's a, a love called filio, which design, defines the kind of love that we have that's considered like brotherly love, love for mankind, love for one another. Agape love requires a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Agape love gives and sacrifices nothing, but filio love is something that can be experienced by both believers and non-believers. It's contrast to agape. So that's the two different kinds of love. First Corinthians talks about, it's the love chapter in the Bible. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Um, and it goes on, it's a long scripture. First Corinthians 13, one through 13 is considered the love passage. And it goes, um, at the very end it says, now I know in part, then I shall know full, fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. 
but the greatest of these is love. So the Bible tells us over and over and over that love is the greatest thing that we can experience. And just as I was saying, his love is described as being patient and kind and truthful, unselfish, trusting, believing, hoping, enduring. It is not jealous, boastful, arrogant, rude, selfish, or angry. True love never fails. The description perfectly fits God's love toward us and should be the way we love each other and the way that we love God. Actually, we are probably on this earth never going to meet a person who perfectly fulfills the biblical definition of love because we are flawed human beings. But we can strive and we can work really hard to know that love. Matthew 22, 37 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Um, and then he goes on to say, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So some of the definitions from biblical dictionaries and commentaries says that love is unselfish, benevolent concern for another. The self-denying, self-sacrificing, Christ-like love, which is the foundation of all other graces. Just the very things that I just read from you from the scriptures. One of the main messages that comes through loud and clear from studying the Bible is the extreme importance that God our Father placed that everyone learn how to love him, love ourselves, and love one another. That is, you know, we even have to go as far to love our enemies, and that's hard. That's something that we probably will have to work on from now until we go home to be with God. But Luke 8, Luke 6, 35 says, But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and your sons of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. So our abilities as fallen humans to love one another is very limited. But you'd be amazed sometimes the things that you can do through Christ's power. And we're going to fail. And there's going to be times that we don't love people like we should. There's going to be times when we don't even love ourselves, and that we don't even love God like we should. But that is a constant, ongoing process that we're going to work on until we go to be with the Holy Father. And that's the very reason that it's so important for you to work and to intercede with the Holy Spirit and to ask Him to help you to do those very things that you need to do. The Holy Spirit empowers us. So that's where we're going to get the strength and the ability to do and to love like God wants us to. So when we accept Christ, we should, you know, or I mean, if you've been a Christian for years and you just know this is an area that you definitely need to work on, you need to ask God or ask the Holy Spirit to start working in you quickly. You know, you can be the greatest man of God or woman of God, and you can have some great gifts from God flowing through you. But if you're not walking within all of this with the spirit of love and humility, it's all been for naught. So you've got to seek the Holy Spirit. And, I mean, if you desire to have the gifts of the Spirit, there's times when I love greater than others. There's times when I need work on myself. There's times when I don't want to love somebody because they've done something to me or they've hurt me. But I can love a person. I mean, there are people in our lives that have hurt us very, very badly. But we can't hate them because hatred and unforgiveness will cause us to lose our salvation. It will place this unforgiveness ties you up in knots. And it's like a sermon that Jensen Franklin preached one time. Um, it's like a boa constrictor that has you wrapped up and it's choking the life out of you before you even know what is going on. So if you're not walking in the attempt to love in a godly way, you need to start asking God to help you to do that. I ask him this very day to... Since I've been studying this, Lord, show me how I can love even more. Show me how to love in a manner 
that you're pleased. Are we always gonna do everything perfect? Heck no, we're human. We are perfectly imperfect, as I've said before. But when we strive to do that and then we start walking, you can tell when you're walking in love, you feel different about things, your emotions are different. You have a different spirit about you. Everything doesn't set you off like a time bomb because you are able to process it differently when you are walking in love. And I pray today that this has touched you. I pray that it's helped you to understand that you need the love of God and you need the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you, quickening you to make a change in your life. We all need changes. Oh my gosh. We will never be perfect until we get home. And what a beautiful day it's going to be. Y'all, it's going to be worth the thought. It's going to be worth everything we're going through. I've been listening to a man that talks a lot about current events and everything that's going on in the world from a biblical standpoint. And he told yesterday, he said, do not forget that God is in still in control. You look around and there is chaos everywhere. And if you're not careful, you'll get so burdened down. You're just like, huh, what's the use? Nobody is fair. Nobody is honest. Everybody lies. No. No, everybody don't. God is still in control. He's not been caught off guard by anything that's happening in this world. He is an on time God. And I pray that this week that you will pray for him to uh, fill your life. The next one I'll be doing is about joy. A lot of people have lost their joy. And let's talk about what joy is and how you can get your joy back. Until the next lesson, remember John 10, 10 says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God says, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Until next time, God bless. Love y'all. See ya. Bye.